All right, it's nice to have a small and but austere group of people here around this fireside chat. We're really glad to have Rear Admiral Todd with us today. We just wish we could have imported an actual fireside, uh, but, but that might break fire code. So I think we'll let that pass this time. But maybe you can light some fires around your tables and in conversation after, after this fireside chat with the Admiral and the President. I'm waiting for the final go ahead so that we can launch right in. I can let you know that I am Dr. Catherine Horvath. I'm on faculty here at Gordon-Conwell. I am the director also of Mentored Ministry and the director of career services here on the Hamilton campus. I'd like to welcome those from our other campuses who are tuning in from Boston, from Charlotte, and from Jacksonville. And uh, we're excited that you are here albeit virtually, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, you connecting with potential Navy chaplain, not potential, but actual Navy, Navy chaplain recruiters in your area. Maybe some of you are potential ones. We had a training for our students on Saturday about mentored ministry, and one of our students has recently become uh, commissioned as uh, a candidate in the a Navy chaplaincy program, and he was very happy about that, very proud. Uh, about that. And so what I did was I took this, this uh, wonderful picture of Rear Admiral Todd and I superimposed our students' head of, on your shoulders. I uh, hope you don't mind, because I said that will be our student in 20 or 25 years, maybe 30. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, may it be. All right. Well, I'm still waiting for the final go ahead, but. I want us to make the best use of our time. My watch is broken, so I've got to rely on my phone. I also have a long introduction, a, a, a storied and excellent introduction of uh, the Rear Admiral today. Uh, he has a wonderful background and bio. He's been serving God and serving the US Navy for many, many years. And uh, as I was telling his attache, that uh, how should I how should I introduce the admiral? I mean, uh, he's been everywhere and done everything. Now take it away, <laughs> Admiral Todd. <laughs> it's it's almost like that. But I do have a little bit of introduction for you uh, on at for Admiral Todd. Rear Admiral Gregory Todd serves as the 28th Chief of Chaplains of the Navy. Previously, he was the 20th Chaplain of the Marine Corps and the 10th chaplain of the Coast Guard. We have a Coast Guard chaplain with us here today. Admiral Todd served in operational assignments at sea, in combat, and with, was the first responder for the US Navy in uh, New York during 9-11. So I would love, we would all love to hear many stories of your service and the ways you've been able to serve our country and our Lord over the years. For those of us who are familiar with Gordon Conwell, which is how you heard about this fireside chat to begin with, you know our beloved Dr. Scott Sunquist, And uh, we're very glad to have Scott with us to meet our wonderful guest for uh, this day, Rear Admiral Gregory Todd. So without any further ado, Scott and Greg, welcome and have your chat. Great to be here. Actually, I wish we had recorded our last half hour in the office. We wouldn't have to do this because we uh, had a wonderful time talking about mutual concerns and ministry and his background and so forth. But I'd like to begin with a verse of scripture that I read this morning, which I think is quite appropriate and it kind of centers us here. It's from 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit he has given us. What a beautiful sort of reminder of the essence of the gospel built around commands and love, but it's all love from first uh, to the end. It's all grace. So we're thankful that you're here today. I'd like to begin just by asking the obvious question we all want to know, and that's a little bit about your background and how you came into this. And please tell us a little bit about other ministry experiences that you had. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, so I 
was ordained in 1988 and started out as a campus pastor at Southern Illinois University and had campus ministry down there in Carbondale, Illinois. After two years, I received a call to be a parish pastor in a little bitty town in Southern Illinois called Jacob, Illinois, it's close to the Mississippi River, but stayed as a, a reservist in the chaplain corps. I had gotten into the chaplaincy through a student program while I was a, a seminary student and decided to be a reservist. Enjoyed it, but really was focused on parish ministry, but there was that nagging tug, you know, into the military. Had, was having some great experience in my reserve ministry. And then the Mississippi River flooded, which uh, drove some uh, perspectives for myself and my family where we thought, maybe the Lord's trying to get our attention. He sometimes used floods to do that, so uh, he did that for us. And the Navy, the following fall, asked if I would consider at least one tour on active duty, and that was 30 years T ago. Tell me, the, but you talked a little bit about the flood, what it meant to your congregation and your own family. You have right. five daughters. This five is like daughters. big. Yeah, it was a big deal because, you know, I had invitations to come on active duty before that, but really from my own personal weakness, I would mm -hmm. say, my own personal perspective, I thought that I was keeping those little girls safe mm -hmm. in this nice country enclave church. I didn't want to take them off to the big city and uh, was concerned about their safety. It was very myopic. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord really kind of showed me, it's like, you're, you're not putting your safety, your concern for safety in the right place. In other words, trust in me. Mm -hmm. And so when I said, okay, Lord, I will now trust in you, when that call came in the fall to think about active duty, I was in a place then where I could say, okay, I'm gonna take these little girls off to the big city and uh, see how this goes. And it's, again, 30 years later, it's gone and, well. and it's not like uh, the government took a real long time getting this confirmed, yeah, right? Yeah, no, you know, you know I, I know how long things take in the, in the Navy and in the military. And so it became, uh, I, again, I put in my, my yes to say I would come on active duty, and three weeks later, the letter comes back and says, congratulations. <laughs> well, nothing happens in the Navy in three weeks, I can tell you that right now. But that three-week short time for span really kind of told mm -hmm. me, hey, maybe the Lord's hand's in this. Yeah. And tell me about some of the, the differences between pastoring a local church, ministry, and college campus with right. a Lutheran church. And then the Navy, what, what kind of changes took place in terms of the type of ministry and preparation and so forth? Yeah, you know, the Navy has a lot in common with campus ministry. So that aspect I felt comfortable with, mm -hmm. particularly that age group, 18 to 25 year olds. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting to me that the church has become very concerned about uh, the departure of young people out of the church. And so how do we get young people back in the church? And I would say, well, come fish in my pond, I've got it stocked. There's 18 to 25 year olds all over the place. What a great opportunity to reach out to that demographic. So that part was similar. The part that was different was really kind of the, the level of, of pastoral care and pastoral hmm. engagement that I had in the parish. I, I often say in the first six months on active duty, I had more pastoral counseling experiences than I had the previous six years in parish ministry. Wow. It was it was intense. It's, it has a lot to do with the fact that we as chaplains, we're wear, wearing the same uniform. We're part of the institution. Mm -hmm. There's an expectation that, okay, we we know the culture. It's almost like missionary work, you know, new culture, new language, new clothing. Uh, we're in there as missionaries, but we're par we're embedded. We're mm -hmm. part of the team, and so you don't necessarily only have Christians that are coming to yeah. talk to you. You're having all faith traditions and no faith traditions that are coming to talk to you because you're a trusted agent within the let me, let me You're speaking my language now because we were missionaries. So let's drill down a little bit on what it means to see chaplaincy work as sort of a missionary calling. Can you unpack that a little bit more? Yeah, I think when, whenever we talk missionary calling, we, we first begin with our sense of calling. Right. You know, what are we called to do? What's our, what's our, our mission, our focus? We, we talk mission in the military is what, what do I need to accomplish? But it always is grounded in our vocation, our mission 
in the church, you know. The, we're, we're grounded in the church, but we as missionaries are reaching out. And we think about those 18 to 25 year olds, it's a whole separate culture. We're reaching out to bring them into the church, to hear the gospel, mm -hmm. to be connected to, to our Lord mm -hmm. through, through, in my tradition, we would say word and sacrament. But that, that sense of connecting them to the Lord. But you're not sitting there in the church waiting for them to show up. Mm -hmm. You're out there with them. This is, we have a, a saying in, our, in the Navy Chaplain Corps, we say deck plate ministry. And the idea here is that the, the ships are, they have decks. Those are the mm -hmm. walkways, the places you walk. And so deck plates, they're made of steel. It means you're out and about. Mm -hmm. You're walking around, you're connecting with people and really where they're mm -hmm. at. Let me drill down a little bit a further, st or a earlier statement that you made, I think it was, was quite significant. The first six months you encountered more counseling issues and so forth. So you've got this, in a sense, group that you're trying to reach or they're trying to reach out to, and they've got lots of issues. Yeah. What are, what's the gamut of the kinds of issues? Because it's a, it's a particular age group. You know, 18 to 25 is a lot of them. Right. So what are the, can you describe, maybe tell some stories. We'd like to hear stories. Yeah, stories are always good, yes. Be careful with a sailor, though, a sea story. So <laughs> you've got to be careful. The, the thing uh, about this demographic, this age group, is that we've deemed them to be adults. Mm -hmm. uh, but they've gone from kid to adult almost abruptly. I would prefer to call them uh, adults in training. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they've got some training wheels on. The ministry, we kind of draw alongside them in that role where, where they're, they're, their uncle, their coach, their mentor, their friend, but drawing alongside them to mentor them, to help them through some of these challenges. The, the, this, this demographic, there are uh, some amazing young people that are joining the military. People of resilience, people of strength, people of commitment to serve. Those are amazing people, but they're also uh, limited in their experience. They're young. And so they're challenged by some things. There, there's also a certain element of this demographic that joins the military to find connection. Mm -hmm. there's, there's many within our flock who who, are, who had no connection, who had no family. They may have grown up in a situation where nobody in their life has said, I'm proud of you. Mm. Nobody in their life has said, I love you. And so they, they end up joining the military often for that sense of service, but also that sense of being part of something bigger than themselves, meaning, purpose, and values. But they don't have the skill sets mm. to necessarily always endure some of the challenges that we have. So some of the issues we see, we, we, we see uh, family issues, we see marriage issues, we see wrestling with faith often. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of, the, some of our best ministry happens on the watches late at night mm -hmm. when you're one-on-one -on -one with a sailor in the Marine and they, they'll say something like, hey, I saw this horror movie and and some vision of, of the devil or angels or something, and they've never read the Bible. But here's somebody that is an expert. Let's talk about the Bible in, in chaplaincy work, yeah. because I've often thought, I, I did student ministry, and quite often it was just carrying around a Bible, yeah. and then being able to recite a verse or something. What is the role of the Bible in chaplaincy work, especially when you have such a diverse group of people? Yeah, that's, you, you know, that's kind of the exciting part, quite frankly as you meet people where they're at, mm -hmm. and you listen to their story, and you, by your connection with them, by your accessibility to them, you win their trust. And it's at that point that you say, can I share with you something that's important to me? Mm -hmm. It almost harkens back to Paul on Mars Hill, right? right, right. Let me tell you about this unknown God. Mm -hmm. We get that opportunity. What's amazing, though, is to watch God work in that. You share what's important to you. You share the gospel. You tell them about Jesus. Not, not in an aggressive way, mm -hmm. but in, again, we talk coaching and mentoring way. And to see the impact mm -hmm. that that makes on people's lives. One of the comments you made earlier on is you're like a coach, like a father, and so forth. Yeah. And, and it, it did strike me that 
uh, young men taken away from their family, their church, their school, their town, and everything are sort of adrift, which is a good you know, Navy language. Yes, it is. Um, it, are adrift. In, in what ways is that opportunity, and in, in what ways also is that maybe something that you have to be very careful about? I like what you just said, though, about being very careful yeah. about that, because there, there, is this, um, uh, there is this tendency sometimes in our zeal mm -hmm. for the gospel that we come off as very aggressive, mm -hmm. and that's a concern. Um, we're in an age where that will turn people off, mm -hmm. and so that sense of, of being gentle, mm -hmm. that sense of drawing alongside, being available to them. When I was in... Um, Afghanistan with Marines. I, I, I had many Marines who were not Christian. Many that were, but many that were not. And when we first met, they were kind of sideways glance. And I remember one in particular who was uh, a, a pagan. She was a, a Wiccan. And you, you could just imagine what she thought about me being there. But it was halfway through the deployment that she says, hey, Chaplain, can I talk to you? And uh, yeah, I did like you, a little yeah. <laughs> eyebrow raise, and I said, uh, uh, are you sure? Yeah, you know, I'd always just been friendly with her, and she mm. says, yeah. She says, I, I, I know you care. Mm. And I think that, that's the, the key part of it. Uh, we come at it as Christians, and it's our Christianity that drives us, as the scriptures remind yeah, us, yeah. to love. Mm -hmm. Drives us to love. Let that love, let that, that caring speak for us and then give us opportunity mm -hmm. to share the gospel. I think we need to hear more stories. Do you have another story <laughs> maybe about where somebody came for one reason and as you led them through a process, they either became a disciple or all of a sudden reaffirmed their faith? Yeah, I, that, oh, many. Uh, yeah, well, just, many. just a few now. We don't okay, have a lot of I, well, now I'm stuck. Um, yeah. I, there's one in particular. It, it's funny how um, it's, it's funny how people get confused in their thinking, right? And I had a sailor come to me, and the story was, Chaplain, I believe God is telling me to to leave my wife, and um, and take up a relationship with my girlfriend. We were on deployment and. He'd been away from his wife for a couple of months. And, you know, I looked him square in the eye and I said, I don't think that's God telling you that. Mm -hmm. it, and he was shocked. And I said, no, nah, it's not God telling you that. Well, how do you know? Well, because God speaks very clearly in his Bible. And what you're suggesting is not there. It's, it's actually counter to what's in yeah. the Bible. And that led us then to a conversation about the importance of marriage, and how we live our lives in support of mm. that, that uh, covenant that God has given us. He got back after the deployment and said, I need to spend more time working on my marriage. Wow. And, and in fact, did that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he was coming for one reason yeah. <laughs> and left with another. But again, this, this is a relationship that's built out of trust. Mm -hmm. And again, we're part of the institution, we're embedded, and we're available and with mm. them. And that's a, that's a key element of, of mm. leadership, of spiritual leadership, right. is building that trust and building that availability. That, that's that's a, it's both a great story and a reminder about gentleness, leading people along, coming alongside, and, and building trust. And you described to me earlier that there's a, a little bit of trust that's built simply because you're in the same culture together yeah. in, in the military. And, but and also, there's this common culture, but then there's America. You're a part of America. America's a very diverse nation. We have yeah. different religions. And so even in the military, you're called upon to provide some kind of care with people of other religions, but also to work alongside chaplains of other religions. Can you talk a little bit about that? You, you know, that's quite frankly one of the, the great adventures of Navy chaplaincy is having those interactions with other mm -hmm. faith traditions. And this is not that you give up anything. Right. You don't give up who you are. Our motto at our chaplain's school is cooperation without compromise. So it's very important that we maintain our, our identity mm -hmm. as Christians, as ministers of the gospel, 
but the opportunity to interact with different perspectives on that helps us sharpen in mm -hmm. that perspective and so oftentimes learn things from the other perspectives as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had close friends who are Roman Catholic priests, Orthodox priests, Jewish rabbis, uh, Christians from other uh, perspectives. In the chaplain corps, we have Muslims, we have Buddhists. So there's a huge variety but it strengthens us in mm -hmm. who we are as ministers of the gospel. And in some ways, it creates sort of this global presence that's more concentrated that we can avoid in our towns in New England or somewhere, but in the, in the Navy, you can't avoid that. No way. How, do, do Buddhists come and talk to you, or they say, I need to find a Buddhist to talk to? Y yes, yes and yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes, they do come mm -hmm. to us, and maybe it's just for that uh, to facilitate the things that they need. Mm -hmm. Hey, chaplain, I need a space to, to do my, my worship, my mm -hmm. rites. And it would be really great if you could connect me mm -hmm. with a, a chaplain of my faith tradition. When I was uh, in Kuwait, it was prior to starting OIF, I had a cadre of probably about six to seven Muslim chaplains in my unit. And they, you know, we facilitated for them, but when it came to, we're getting ready to kick off the war and all, they really wanted to connect with an imam. And thankfully, mm -hmm. there was a Muslim chaplain that got brought into the area and I connected with him. I said, hey, come with me. Would you mind kind of taking care of my Marines? And he absolutely, hmm. uh, we did that and uh, facilitated for them. That again becomes evidence to the greater culture mm -hmm. in the public square that we are caring people, that we care for everybody. Now, another thing that we talked about earlier uh, in the office was uh, diversity of cultures and races yeah. in the military and so forth, and that affects us all as Americans. How do you approach that in the Navy? Well, the military is a very diverse group anyway. Right. It is uh, a slice of America, but tends to be, I would, I would venture, a little more heavily diverse than your average slice. That's important then that our chaplain corps reflect that mm -hmm. diversity. It becomes more and more evident that the more diversity we have, the more we're able to minister to the institution as a whole. But that's one of those kinds of things that just doesn't happen accidentally. Mm -hmm. We have to have in some intentionality about that. We have to be concerned about that diversity for the sake of the flock, mm -hmm. for the sake of those that we're ministering to. It's, it's not in and of its own sake, mm -hmm. it's for the sake of the flock. Yeah. yeah. That, and that, when we were talking about that, I said, you know, this is the church, the global yeah. church today, and uh, we have the great opportunity, and the church is the place where people come together and are reconciled. Right. And so you have that model. Another uh, thing I was interested in, we talked about leadership. Yeah. And there are issues that you will learn and that our students who go into chaplaincy will have to learn about leadership. Can you talk a little bit about that? And maybe you can talk about your demon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will. I'll start out with a commercial. You know, when I, uh, when I was looking around midpoint in my career, I, I had heard a lot of these stories from sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and gotten to the point where like, yeah, I could probably just sit here and, and be that guy for the rest of my career. But I really felt like I was called to some leadership in the, in the venue mm -hmm. and was looking for a, some extra training in leadership. And Gordon Conwell, uh, I went through my DMIM program down at Charlotte in the leadership track, and it was absolutely what I needed at the time and has proven to be so helpful for, for me uh, since then. You know, the funny thing about the military is that we're really immersed in leadership here. We talk about leadership all the time. We're with groups of people that that's their big thing. Even if you are with uh, a Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps, that Lance Corporal is concerned about leadership. He, he or she may only have one or two people they gotta lead, but they wanna do it the best they can. Right. So what a great environment for us as we seek to, seek to be spiritual leaders mm -hmm. to kind of learn some of those skill sets. Some of the things that I would reflect on in terms of when I got into positions where I was leading other chaplains and all, was first off, um, if I could begin with a construct from the Reformation, we talk about faith in three ways in terms of the, the call to faith, 
the ascent to faith, and then the trust that's involved with that and those three elements. Those, those three elements work really well at, at kind of leading people for a really difficult mission. So as I've had to prepare chaplains to go into combat with Marines and all, I've reflected on those three elements and said, first off, let's help you focus on your call. What is your calling? We talked about that earlier. Right. There is that general call, that call to, to the faith, call to Christianity, call to Jesus. But there's also a, a very specific call, a call to a specific ministry. And it's important that we reflect on, okay, what are you called to do? In, in the military, we say, what's your mission? Hmm. What's the problem you're trying to solve? What's your mission? Who are you directed towards? And we need to be focused on that. So part of that preparation is involved on that calling. What are you called to do? But then there's the second part, the ascent piece. Mm -hmm. And that's saying yes to God. When he calls and we say, yes, I'll do it. Kind of like when, when I uh, was in my parish in Southern Illinois and the call to active duty chaplaincy came, I had to say yes at some point. He kept knocking on the door and I finally had to say yes. That yes requires some intentionality. That's the other thing that I've appreciated in the military is that the, the intentionality with which we approach things has been really helpful in learning how to be a good minister too. Mm -hmm. Where you, you study the context, you study the team that you're ministering to, you're, you're studying how is this gonna work and so you come at it with some intentionality. You're not using a shotgun, if I could use a hunting metaphor, you're not using a shotgun but you're using a rifle. Mm -hmm. You're very targeted and focused on what you're trying to accomplish. So when you say yes to God, you say it with some intentionality and purpose. And finally, that, that, that trust, how does that work out? Well, I would say it's all done in, in a sense of prayer, hmm. where we are in prayer. And this is not just simply uh, talking to God, but again, allowing the scriptures to talk to us, to strengthen us, strengthen our faith, and to interact with God and give us the strength. But all of those things, that sense of calling, assent, prayer, that all happens in community as well. One of the funny things uh, I've noticed is that most clergy are introverts. Well, not all. Not all, <laughs> but many are. And so you start going, and they'll come up with these brilliant ideas. And I, we've seen this within our core, where they're, they're amazing thinkers, but they haven't talked with anybody about it. <laughs> and so when they come with an idea, they don't have the whole team on board right. with that. It's so important with us as ministers mm -hmm. that we bring our team along with us. And that's, again, the thing we learn in the military is that uh, General Mattis used to refer to the vertical pronoun. He wouldn't even use the, the word I because it's all about the team. Mm. It's all about we. And that's what we learned is it's all about that team. How do we bring them along in calling, bring them along in the purposeful uh, mm. uh, yes to calling and bring them along in terms of prayer and trusting in the Lord? Boy, that's a great message about leadership. But can you tell us what the title of your, your dissertation was for your d -Man? Oh, It's a long title, right? Dissertations always have long titles. Uh, preparing Christian Chaplains for Ministry in Combat. For anybody interested in chaplaincy, it would be good to read that. And I'm sure we have it on file. You, you probably do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Another question that, that, that's come up a number of times, but actually not a question, but I'd like you to inspire people watching this video and who are watching this online to think about the chaplaincy in terms of reaching the next generation. Yeah, I would say reaching this generation. Yeah, yeah we talked about the 18 to 25-year-olds as uh, adults in training, but in some respects, they are also the church in training. Mm. And our opportunity to connect with them, mentor them, work with them. Again, come fish in my pond. I've got it stocked. There's so many 18 to 25 year olds that if you can make impact in their life, they carry that back into the churches and they are on fire. Back in World War II, Coca-Cola needed to increase at market share. And so they were selling uh, Coke to, to soldiers for a, a dime. You know, they weren't making any money on it, but everybody got hooked on Coke mm -hmm. and, walked, and came back into the civilian world and now Coke took off. I would say in the same way, we can get people mm -hmm. excited about the gospel 
in the military. The other piece of it, though, and I think sometimes we forget, is what a ripe area to recruit people for ministry as well. That was my next question, so thank you. Yeah, so the opportunity, a lot of the leaders, the, the young officers mm -hmm. in the military, are also prime candidates to be serving in ministry. They, they have already been trained in leadership. They have lived leadership. They're immersed in leadership. And this is an opportunity then if we kind of say, hey, you have, you're kind of growing towards a deep, deeper faith. Have you thought about ministry? And many of them, many of them have. Mm -hmm. I was visiting in Jacksonville, North Carolina a couple of months ago and went to a local church, small little bitty church. They probably worship maybe 50 on a Sunday. And, but a lot of them are Marines, Marine officers. That pastor down there has recruited three Marine officers to go back to seminary. Out of a congregation that only worships 50 on a Sunday, maybe 50 on a Did Sunday. Did you tell them where there's a good seminary they can go <laughs> to? <laughs> we can help you I'll with leave, that. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll pass the word All along. Right, yeah, say, I know a place. Mm. But they, uh, what's fascinating is I asked the pastor, I said, what did you say? You yeah. know, what's in the water here? And he said, uh, all I did was say, you know, you'd make a good pastor. And they had already been thinking about mm -hmm. it. And it just kind of touched that nerve. And, and they heard the call of God mm -hmm. to, to serve. Great story. We need to hear a couple other stories. I, uh, you, you've experienced some combat. Yeah. Can you explain any stories where your chaplaincy work and your training was, as a Christian leader was helpful in the midst of these difficult decisions that are made in the midst of battle? Yeah, I, I can say that's, there's a twofold element to that. You know, when you are assigned as a chaplain in combat, I would say there is that tactical level role, the role to the, the sailor, the Marine, the Coast Guardsman there on the ground doing the hard fighting. My chapel services were packed. Mm. We had a lot of people coming to hear the gospel in, in chapel, so much so they, they built me a chapel there in the middle of Afghanistan. It was just a simple frame with a tent over the top, but we got so many people that they had to, they busted out the sides and raised the wow. side because, and there would be Marines just kind of hanging around the edge of the chapel, just standing there, hanging over the side. So it's a, it's a ripe area to proclaim the gospel. But I, re I remember one, one situation particularly, uh, a Marine wanted to be baptized. And so we planned for it on a, on a particular Sunday. And in, in the preparation, we went through the scriptures to talk about baptism, what is baptism, and, and uh, just to help them understand it. And, but, but when I went to baptize him, he's surrounded by 120 Marines, wow. you know, to, his friends to watch this. And again, we're going through the scriptures. What is baptism? What are we mm. doing here? What's the purpose here? And as I went through all of this, I remember on the front row, there was uh, three fellow Marines sitting up there watching everything, hanging on every word. And we, we baptized this Marine. And then uh, we were finished. And after the service, kind of break up, these three pop up in front of me. And they said, everything you said, we want that. Wow, wow. And we did three more baptisms wow. that day. So it, it, it is a time where, in some respects, you are a spectator mm -hmm. in what God is doing there. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a great place. It's, it's not, we make ourselves available. We put on the uniform. We learn the lingo. We are missionaries in, to, this, to this flock. But at the end of the day, it's God who is doing the mm -hmm. return. And if we are faithful to, to the scriptures, is faithful to his calling to us, he just does amazing things. You know, this has been an amazing discussion that I've had with you today because I, I did student ministry. And the reason I did student ministry is to reach young people who would go out and become leaders. And if I were younger today, after listening to you, I'd say, this is where I might go strategically mm -hmm. in order to have an influence on young leaders and our, our broader culture today. Mm -hmm. But I'm too old. Plus, I took a test when I was in college about, you know, what I was most likely to do when I grew up, and I came out negative being in the military. <laughs> so I don't know what that's about, so I can't do it, so I did student ministry. But yeah. I do want to give you an opportunity uh, to uh, tell me something else that we haven't talked about you'd like to cover, and then also uh, how a person can move forward in chaplaincy if they're interested. 
Yeah, thanks. I, I think the only thing I would say is that the opportunities are ripe right now. I came in, I, I took my first commission while in seminary in 1986, so I'm kind of giving a sense of the arc of my career. But in my whole time in the Navy, I have not seen the level of, uh, of hunger among leaders for more chaplains. The first time since the end of the Cold War, the Navy Chaplain Corps is growing. Wow. It's just amazing. And it's not something that we've kind of cooked up within our own, our, our own world, but the Secretary of the Navy, the Chief of Naval Operations, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, the Commandant of the Coast Guard have all gone on record saying we want more chaplains. Mm. So it's just an incredible opportunity. So it feels like God is working in this, in that there is something that he is doing, and I would just invite uh, anybody to become a part of it. We talk about age. Sometimes that's a hold uh, that holds some people back. I would say if if someone has a sense of calling for this or at least an interest, please just ask. Mm -hmm. We there's we have some older folks that are mm -hmm. are serving. It's not necessarily the age so much as are you in shape enough to hang with mm -hmm. with a group of Marines and that kind of thing. That's always the challenge, but. I remember a, a Catholic priest that came to work for me when I was on the Marine Corps side, 58 years old. He shows up, had never served before. It was his first tour, 58. And I said, Marco, what, what's going on here? And he says, I've been wanting to do this my whole mm. life, but my bishop finally gave me permission to do it, so I'm going to do it. I said, Marco, you've got one tour. One tour, that's all I can do. And he says, I know. I said, well, okay, let's make it a good one. What do you want to do? He says, I want to go serve in combat with Marines. Wow. And so he did. And he did amazing. Mm -hmm. So I would say, it, let's not let our own self-limitations limit us from what God is calling us mm -hmm. to do. There is, there is tremendous opportunity. And of course, we got folks. I can give my 800 number too. So 888-NAVY-CHC. That's an abbreviation. Say it for again. 888-N-A-V-Y-C-H-C. Good. And call that number, and we can connect you with a recruiter and someone that can, can talk about Navy chaplaincy. And if you just do one tour and go back to the parish and say, that was amazing, I, I, I loved it, but now I want to do civilian ministry, we're going to say, thank you for your service. Appreciate you being part of the team, and quite frankly, we'll always consider you a part of the Navy Chaplain yeah. Corps. Well, thank you so much. Rear Admiral Gregory Todd, thank you so much for your time, uh, for opening your heart to us, telling us some stories, and reminding us of the importance of Christian presence in every area of society. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you too. Thank you. I am willing to take any questions, and any of our chaplains are willing to take any questions about chaplaincy, but let me begin by giving you some scope of what's available to you. If you are currently a student at a seminary, the first thing that I would encourage you to consider would be the Navy Chaplain Candidate Program. This is not a full-fledged being a chaplain program, but this is, uh, I would call it ROTC for seminary students. How's that sound? So it is a uh, part-time uh, commitment where you are able to serve while you're a student. You will receive a commission as an ensign in the Navy, so you're an officer. And in your time off from school, you have the opportunity to attend chaplain school and kind of get that requirement, your basic course under your belt. But also after that, if you have any time off from school, we'll send you to things called uh, on-the-job training, or OJT, which means we'll send you to serve on a ship or with the Coast Guard or with a group of Marines and really get to know what it's all about. I did that when I was uh, interested in the Navy Chaplain Corps and found it really helpful. What I didn't like was the classroom time. I'll just admit it. I was one of those people that likes being outside. I like hands-on ministry. Uh, so whenever I got sent to the basic course, I thought, well, this is okay, but it's a lot like being in seminary. But then they sent me 
to serve with the Marines for two weeks. And I don't think we spent more than a couple hours inside. Most of the time was outside, uh, being with Marines, camping out, being in their environment, and I really, really loved it. I loved it for its, for its honesty. Uh, Marines have a way of being very transparent, and very honest with you. There are not a lot of masks, and that's pretty fun. It's pretty awesome being a minister with that, with that level of honesty. But it, it's also a very um, alongside sort of ministry. We use the term paraclete. You know the paraclete in scripture? It literally, the word means to draw alongside. So it is a paracletic ministry. We draw alongside our Marines, sailors, Coast Guardsmen, their families, and walk with them in their spiritual journey, but even more than their spiritual journey, sometimes it's their whole physical journey as well. There's been many times I've done a eight mile hike and um, walked with someone that wasn't sure they were gonna get it to the end of the eight mile hike. And in those eight miles with a full pack, we spent the time talking about a lot of things, life, the soul, our faith, and before they knew it, they were done with their eight-mile hike, and they got through that eight-mile hike. So then the next time we had a hike, which was probably going to be a 12-mile hike, I have a new best friend marching next to me, walking next to me. It's a great ministry, great opportunity. And so if you are in seminary, that student program is a great opportunity to kind of put your toe in the water and see what it's all about and, and really experience kind of the unique missionary work that Navy chaplaincy is. When you go ahead and graduate then, if you are in the student program, if you decide, you know, that was fun, but I, it's not for me, no harm, no foul. You can get out and there's no additional commitment to the program. So it's a great way to get started. But if you do graduate and you say, I really wanna keep doing this, then we're gonna ask you, do you wanna be in the reserves or do you wanna be active duty? If you wanna be in the reserves, it's a tremendous opportunity to kind of have something extra outside your civilian ministry. Civilian ministry is amazing, and I was civilian pastor for six years and really enjoyed it. But sometimes you need that other perspective. And military chaplaincy, Navy chaplaincy is a great help for that as well. You're surrounded by people who talk about leadership all the time. And so you get to know uh, the language of leadership, the way of leadership. I was last coming in for, for pizza here because I... I have a, a part of me that I cannot be the first person in line for food. I can't do it. Because when I was a chaplain with Marines, 3rd Battalion, 24th Marines, an infantry battalion, brand new, Lieutenant Todd, we're out in the field, and we had been eating MREs, meals ready to eat, for a few days, and they finally brought out hot chow. And hot chow for Marines is a big deal. You're getting hot food, finally. And I think, oh, I could really use some hot chow. And I go to, to grab a plate and get in line. And um, one of the Marines says, one of the Marine leaders says, not yet, chaps. Not yet. I said, what do you mean, not yet? He said, the men eat first. The Marines always eat first. We eat last. Never forgot it. The essence of leadership the essence of leadership is taking care of your team, taking care of your flock. And so if you're looking for another venue to learn how to take care of your flock, surrounded by people who are very concerned about leadership, the reserves is an awesome place to, to have that counterbalance in your civilian ministry. But if you wanna come on active duty, which is really what I need, I would love to bring you on active duty, particularly if we've been with you for a couple years through a student program. There is a Department of Defense requirement that all chaplains have two years of pastoral experience post-ordination. But we're willing to look at that and possibly waive that 
if we know you and we know your pastoral formation, we've had some time with you, that's, that's a waverable thing. And so we're, we're willing to have that conversation and bring you on active duty. The Navy, the first time since the end of the Cold War, the Navy is growing the Navy Chaplain Corps. So it, we are increasing at least, this started with uh, some of our ships. We're putting more chaplains on board ships. So that means we're increasing at least 70 to 90 in the next five years. Right now we have 900 on active duty, 900 chaplains. We'll increase at least 70 to 90. But the Marine Corps has also said we want to increase 40 in our ranks as well, at least 40. They actually want more, but they're willing to accept 40 for now. The Coast Guard as well is growing another 15. The aviation community has told me they intend to grow as well as the submarine community as well. I would not be surprised if in the next five to, to 10 years, we would see the Navy Chaplain Corps grow another 300. The, the level of support we have among Navy leaders, three and four star leaders, civilian political appointees is unprecedented in their level of support for Navy chaplaincy. It's an incredible time to the point where those of us are serving are finding ourselves often looking at one another going, are we in the midst of a God thing going on here? Because it is, uh, is just an amazing level of support. I was at a meeting, um, it was actually an offsite with the Secretary of the Navy, his staff, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, the Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, the Chief of Naval Operations, the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy. These are all the leaders of the sea services. And it was a whole day about how do we, how do we get out the mental health concerns we have, particularly suicide in the military. How do, we, how do we get there? And it started out a lot of research in the mental health world. But in the afternoon, a whole panel of mental health providers who were advising the Secretary of the Navy finally looked at him and said, we don't need more mental health providers. What we need are more chaplains. And from that moment on, the conversation went, more chaplains, more chaplains, more chaplains, until this went on for a couple hours. It was, it was just a, the most amazing thing. And the last voice was the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, the, the most senior enlisted leader in the Marine Corps, pounding the table and said, what we need are more chaplains, more chaplains, more chaplains. That's the, where we're at right now. So if anyone of you or any of your friends or anyone is interested, please let us know. Uh, we've got an 800 number and we've got uh, our, our recruiting team here, but our 800 number is 888-N-A-V-Y-C-H-C. 888-N-A-V-Y-C-H-C. And we'll connect you with a recruiter. With that, I am very excited about taking questions. If anybody wants to ask some questions, please. How old are you? No. You are not. And um, forgive me, but you look like you're in good shape, too. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. OK, so um, just be advised. We're, we're sending you to minister to young people. 18 to 25-year-olds is the bulk of our flock. So, and we ask you to do physical things. Uh, you have to pass physical fitness tests. Uh, we have to be able to make those hikes with people, that kind of thing. But age is not a, not necessarily. No. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, okay, now you're really in trouble. We're going to get your name soon too. But no, not too old. And I would I would say. Um, 
it's a tremendous opportunity, even if you do one tour. Let's say you're in your mid-40s, okay? You're 45, you go ahead and join. And you do, you, you do four years, okay? But in that four years, you've got the leadership experience, you've got that interaction with the 18, 25-year-olds. You kind of, you figure out how your voice is better heard in the public square. You know, uh, the church can sometimes become an echo chamber where we, we talk the same way to our, each other. But when you take the gospel into the public square, you realize you got to do it in a different way. And you, in the military is that, that practice venue for us to, to do that. So you only do four years and then you get out before you're 50. You are a way better pastor when you get out to the parish and you have something very marketable. I, and I got to tell you, I see a lot of obituaries of older people, and when, it, whether they serve four years or, or, or 30 years, they always have it in their obituary, served as a Navy chaplain. It's, it's something that we treasure, and it's something that when you, when you serve as a Navy chaplain, even if it's four years, you're very proud of. So, no, you're not too old. Not yet. There's, we got we to gotta ask a lot of other questions, but, but please don't let that uh, discourage you. Yeah, yeah. What else we got? Yeah, please. Yes. Right. Why is the Navy missing Right. People are not joining. Yeah. There, we're, still, we're, we're still trying to figure that out. You know, what are the limitations? Um, I, I, it's, my, it's my position, though, that recruiting Navy chaplains is different. It's, it's a different motivation that dr draws people in. So we need to look at it as what's, how do, we, how do we contact Navy chaplains? How do we contact clergy to become Navy chaplains? I think a lot of it is just a, a, a lack of awareness. We don't realize that there is this amazing ministry out there. And I, I'm trying to talk with leaders of religious organizations to help them understand that you're not giving up one of your clergy to serve to the Navy. What you're actually doing is extending your reach. It's ministry, it's mission work, it's missionary work, because you're extending your reach into this group of 18 to 25 year olds. And you're bringing your message, your gospel message into that situation and God willing, bringing them back into the church. And not only that, but it's a great opportunity for us to recruit more pastors into, uh, into the ministry. You think about it, these, this is a, particularly among the officers, you know, they've got their bachelor's degree already, and they're immersed in a life of leadership. But what if, what if they get that call, that call to the gospel ministry? We, we bring them into the seminary, then we teach them the theology they need to know, but we don't need to teach them leadership at that point. We can put them back, come back as chaplains, amazing, I'm happy. But even just being back into the civilian ministry, they're amazing pastors at that point, amazing ministers at that point, because, and they're young, and they've got experience dealing in the public square. They get all of that stuff, and they become really good. There was a, um, when I was in Afghanistan, uh, there was a young Marine that I served with. It was a sergeant, um, and we interacted quite a bit, and he, he came to my services occasional time, but he was often out, you know, out and doing, uh, difficult things, but we were always in contact while he was doing stuff. At one point, we talked about ministry. Well, he got out of the Marine Corps and went back to school and went to seminary and um, is, uh, uh, became ordained. He's a pastor in Boston right now at First Lutheran Church, James Hopkins. Uh, we, brought him, we brought him in as a chaplain. He, he made it to Mass Sergeant doing in the Marine Corps Reserve. And then, uh, and then we brought him in as a chaplain. He served for, he was an amazing chaplain. And now he's an amazing pastor because he learned how to lead 
and then we taught him theology. And, and then he, be, he was just a great leader, a great pastor, still is a great pastor. Yeah, yeah, there's an opportunity here. Yeah. Everybody get enough pizza? All right. Sure. Yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't have military experience before I came in as a chaplain. So I, I, I'm, I'm that example. But I will tell you, the, the one thing that I believe is the distinctive piece of that, why, why you're successful, is that if you approach it as missionary work, just like you would uh, if you were a missionary in a foreign country. If you think about the military, it's got its own language, it's got its own dress, it's got its own norms, its own ethos, its own culture. If you recognize that and say, okay, this is a different culture, I need to learn the culture, that's when you become successful. But it's the same skill sets we apply if we send you uh, for foreign mi missionary work as well. So it's the, it's the same thing. If you approach the military though as, I'm gonna treat this just like civilian parish ministry, that's, that's when you're limited. Because you'll, you'll sit in your office, wait for people to show up that'll never show up. You know, you got to be there. You got to be out there. You got to be a paraclete alongside them and, and ministering to, with them in their set, setting. Right on, right? Yeah. Please, back there. Yeah, we've, we've adopted a term, if I understand the question right, though, it's like it, we're talking more about spirituality rather than religion. Yeah. And I would say beware the false dichotomy. Beware the either-or approach. There is a both approach to this. And I would, I would simply point you to Paul at Mars Hill. He takes the both approach when he says, let me introduce you to this God that you don't know. In the, the Navy, we've uh, adopted a term that we call spiritual readiness. And that we're, so we're borrowing that language, that spiritual language. But it's the language out of the human performance model. But we kind of sharpened our elbows a little bit and pushed some of the other folks out of the way to say, no, this is our world. When we're talking about the spiritual, you need to come talk to us about it. We've worked with the researchers to do some amazing, uh, powerful, powerful research on uh, the role of religion and spirituality to human flourishing. It's out of that research within the military and external to the military that the military leaders are saying, we think you're on to something, keep using that language. Does it exclude us then from talking about our faith or religion? Not at all. Not at all. In fact, what it ends up doing is it pulls us into the ebb and flow of the institution where it becomes more normalized, more natural that we can talk about faith, religion, all part of an overall construct of spirituality. So it's, it's leveraging some of that academic language right now to give us the entree, just like Paul did, give us the entree into the institution to be able to have that kind of conversation. Did I answer your question on that one? Yeah, thanks. We had another one back there, too. Yeah. Yeah.
No, absolutely. Right. It, it's really a question of how do our spouses react to us in, in service uh, because they don't know what they're getting into, but their intuition is actually pretty good because they're realizing, hey, if my spouse is getting into this chaplaincy thing, I have a feeling it'll impact my life. And how will that, yeah, will they get dragged into this? And I would say their intuition is right. It becomes a whole family sort of event. Um, and that, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. There are, there are challenges to it. And yet there are also benefits. I was a parish pastor for four years. That's an all-consuming role. Uh, particularly, I'm living in the parsonage right next to the church, right? And so, all-consuming role. Our, on our 10th wedding anniversary, I finally got some time off and was able to, my wife and I are able to, to go and spend a couple days away, just a couple days away. Uh, the, the grandparents were the, with the kids and all. And I called back, this is before cell phones, but I called back to the church just to let them know where I was. And they said, Pastor, we need you to come back. One of the, one of the old time members had, had just died and I needed to do her funeral. Um, that's the role of the pastor. So when I came on active duty, uh, of course that was my ethos at that point, but then I started finding myself with a lot more free time. Where did that come from? Well, because you get, you get 30 days of leave every year. 30 days vacation. You get four weeks vacation every year, right when you come in. And then you can, you can accrue it over time. You can't accrue over 60 days, but at some point, the institution expects you to take some time off. And then there is uh, the, the expectation, not a lot of time off, but it's a, more of a deliberate approach to a, a good work-life balance than I found in the civilian parish. So there's that positive. But then there is the part, that, and I, would, I wish my wife was here uh, because I, would, I wish she could tell how it affected her. Uh, she loved being a parish pastor's wife. My, my wife is the bane of all pastor's wives. She plays the organ and likes, likes teaching Sunday school. You know, and they're like, oh, you're the one everybody wants. And I said, yeah, she kind of is. Um, but she, she loved uh, what she was finding in the Navy world as well because the interaction with other Navy spouses while we were deployed and the relationships built out of that. And, uh, you know, we raised five daughters and I, I've always kind of been concerned that, oh, you know, did I make your life miserable by doing this thing? And they will, all of them will say, no, we got to do so much. And when we talk to our friends about, you know, things, uh, we talk about it in our experience. You know, they were in school and talking about, I remember one, one of my daughters said, we were talking about the Grand Canyon. And I said, yeah. And she started talking about when we visited the Grand Canyon on a, on a move across country that we had made. And all the other kids looked at her like, wow, you got to do that. So, uh, and all my kids, when they turned 18, you know, they, or graduate from college, they have to turn in their ID cards. All of them, all of them said it was a grieving experience for them. They felt like they were leaving something. As it is now, my, my one daughter, uh, <laughs> she kept her ID card long after she was supposed to turn it in. And uh, she was coming on base one time and the guard said, I'm sorry, honey, I gotta confiscate this. She got her ID card confiscated. I have a feeling it had an impact on her career choice because she was so upset about that that she, uh, she now works for the Navy. She's a, she's a social worker for the Navy and I don't think she'll ever give up her ID card. So it, 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 it's just different. I, and I get the things with spouses. Um, let's, let's get your email address. I want to shoot you an article 
and I'll try to, maybe, Catherine, we can shoot it out to everybody. But one of our Navy chaplains, uh, a chaplain by the name of Jaime Nava, his wife is a, a prolific author, and she's written some articles about her life as a Navy chaplain, a chaplain's spouse, and um, it's, it's, been in, it's been impactful for a lot of people. We'll try to get that connected to you. What's interesting is she was exactly that Navy spouse that didn't want him to come on active duty. She, she's like, no, I don't want you to do this. Just flat out, no. And then, you know, he just kind of continued and perished past her, but she said she, she saw the calling. She saw him, that sense of calling in him, and she finally acquiesced and said, okay, one tour. And now she's a cheerleader for the Navy. She loves it. So I get it. I get it. It's hard and it's scary. Again, I would go back to the CCPO program, the Chaplain Candidate Program. It's a great opportunity to kind of just try it out, see what it's like, and introduce uh, our families to what this is all about as well. It's a great opportunity. But that's, a, that's an excellent question. All right. Oh, stories, yeah. The receptivity of the sailors and the Marines who we've ministered to. Right. Um, what would you share as sort of uh, reflective or, or characteristic of, of some of the receptivity? Yeah, I, I'll tell an old sea story. I don't like to tell cha uh, stories on other chaplains unless they're positive because I like people to tell their own stories. But I will tell you, when I was young chaplain, I was assigned to what's called a guided missile cruiser. It's a ship of about 400 sailors, at least at that time it was about 400. And I had been on board the ship for, oh, a couple years. And I knew, I knew almost everybody on that ship. And I would go through the, sh the ship and talk to sailors and connect with them. And this is the way I thought my, my job should go. Um, it was interesting though, part of that job I was, uh, I, I would run fire drills. Fire on the ship is a big deal and, because there's nowhere to go. You can't run away, you have to put it out. And so everybody becomes a firefighter, even the chaplain. And so I was trained in firefighting and uh, would run fire drills. And my location during the fire drills put me in contact with a lot of sailors. So I, I knew a lot of sailors, I knew their families, I knew a lot of stuff that was going on with them. But there was always rotation. And I was doing one of my walk arounds one day and I go up into uh, the uh, Hilo hangar bay and there's a group of sailors that's doing something called fancy work. I know it sounds weird, right? But the Navy is a traditional organization, and these sailors were tasked on making sure the decks look good and everything looks nice when we have guests on board. And part of their job was that they would macrame these, these uh, awnings that would fit over things. And so they're, it's really tedious work and they're doing macrame and they're doing this, this thing. And I, it's a great opportunity to sit down and just chat with them. And um, so I would come up and I would just sit and visit with them. I'm not gonna try to do macrame, I'll mess up the job, but uh, I'm talking with them while they're doing it. And uh, as I'm chatting with them, one of the new guys on the team, he kind of says, hey chaps, uh, don't you have work to do or something? Like, why are you sitting here talking to us? And uh, again, transparency, right? They'll just ask you flat out. And one of his shipmates, he says, he is doing his job. This is what his job is. And he's very serious. He said, he takes care of us. And I thought, Whew. <laughs> put that on my tombstone. I, there could be no better epitaph for me than he takes care of us. So that's the nature of Navy chaplaincy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your time. I do believe we have extra pizza, so you gotta, you got to eat it because we can't take it with us. Back in the corner. Get in there. All right. Thank you all. God bless.